In this video, we're going to look at hypergeometric functions and elliptical integrals and how they're related in some way or the other. So my idea for this video really came from the fact that I've always wanted to learn a little bit about these two subjects and they were and I knew they were related somehow. Okay, let's look at some definitions. The first thing that we need is the rising factorial. And so unfortunately, this looks a lot like the notation used for the Pa camera symbol. If you watched my number theory version 2 playlist when we did the number theory of Ramanujan at the end, although it's a slightly different object. So it's defined for any complex number A, although I bet you could define it over some sort of larger algebra if you wanted to. And this parentheses A0 is defined to be the number 1. And then a n is a times a plus 1 times a plus 2 all the way up to a plus n minus 1. So let's notice that there are n total terms in this product. That's why we think of it as a rising factorial because it starts here and rises up with n products. Just like a factorial starts at n and descends down with n terms. Now, the first thing that we'll do is define this thing called the ordinary hypergeometric function. So it has parameters a, b, and c, which are complex numbers. And there's one restriction that c cannot be a non-positive integer. So it could be a positive integer, and it could be a negative real number, but it just can't be like 0, negative 1, negative 2, so on and so forth. And I don't actually know how you say this out loud, but we've got two subscripts with a capital letter F. One subscript is to the left and one subscript is to the right. So I don't know if you read this as 2F1 or F21. Maybe post in the comments if you know. And then we have the parameters A, B, and C. And then our variable Z. And it's defined to be the sum as N goes from zero to infinity of this A, N, bn over cn n factorial z to the n. And there's one more thing that we need to define, and that's the complete elliptic integral of the first kind. So in an upcoming video, we'll look at the complete elliptic integral of the second kind as well. And that's defined by this function capital K, and the variable is lowercase k. That's the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of d theta over the square root of 1 minus k squared sine squared theta. This is called an elliptical integral because it's related to finding the perimeter of an ellipse. And in fact, these things don't have some sort of closed antiderivative. That's why they define a class of objects on their own. Okay, so the first question that we'll look at is why the word hypergeometric? And so let's dive into that. Well, let's start by noticing that if we take the number one in, in other words, the rising factorial starting from the, from the number one, we get one times two times three, all the way ending at n. But that's clearly just n factorial. Then if we look at the hypergeometric function, f21 of one, 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 z, you'll see that we get the sum as n goes from 0 up to infinity of 1n, but that's n factorial, 1n, that's another n factorial, and then likewise we've got two n factorials in the denominator from this stuff right here, and then z to the n. But clearly lots of stuff cancels, and we get the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of just z to the n. But that's exactly a geometric series. And we could, in fact, rewrite this as 1 over 1 minus z if we wanted to. So that's why we have the word hypergeometric series, because this is some sort of natural generalization of the ordinary geometric series. And in fact, there are some other interesting cases. Maybe we'll look at one of them, but there's a lot more that we'll maybe explore in a future video. Let's take 2F1 and then 1, 2, 1Z and see what we get for that. So that'll be the sum as n goes from 0 up to infinity of 1n. That's just n factorial. Then we have 2n. Well, let's calculate that. That's going to be 2 times 3 times 4 all the way up to n plus 1. That's because we need a total product of n terms. 
So that means that we'll have an n plus 1 factorial here over n factorial, n factorial, and then a z to the n. But now lots of stuff naturally cancels here. This guy cancels with this guy. And then this guy will cancel this guy down to just n plus 1. OK, but we could rewrite this as the sum as n goes from 0 up to infinity of n plus 1 times z to the n. But that looks exactly like a re-indexed version of the derivative of a geometric series. And in fact, it is. It's the derivative of this, which is 1 over 1 minus z squared. So you see, just by some slight tweaks, we get things that are kind of naturally related to geometric series. Like I said, there's lots of more coincidences between this hypergeometric function and then like maybe more commonly known functions that you would have maybe learned about in calculus that we'll explore in an upcoming video. Okay, so now that we've got this sort of first line of questioning out of the way, let's prove like maybe the main result from this video, which is some sort of relationship between complete elliptical integrals of the first kind and these ordinary hypergeometric functions. So as promised, now we're going to fuse some sort of relationship between these elliptic integrals and these hypergeometric functions. And this is the following identity that we will prove. So we've got k evaluated at k. In other words, this complete elliptic integral of the first kind is equal to pi over 2 times 2f1 and then half half 1k squared. So in other words, the parameters have value half half 1 and then z has been replaced with k squared. And I should say that there is something going on with the radius of convergence here. And in our general case over here, we need the modulus of z to be less than 1, which means in this case as well, we need k squared to be less than 1. And this guy only really sort of makes sense if k is a real number. So that's why I've like taken my modulus out there. Okay, so now let's get to it. So we'll use our definition of this elliptic integral of the first kind. So that's going to be equal to the integral from 0 to pi halves. And then we have d theta over the square root of 1 minus k squared times sine squared theta, like that. But now I'm going to take that square root and rewrite it as a binomial. And that's going to motivate some sort of expansion via binomial series expansion. So this is going to be 1 minus k times sine theta quantity squared to the negative half. And then we have d theta. So now we're expanding this using the binomial formula. So that's going to give us the sum as n goes from 0 up to infinity. And then I have minus 1 to the n because I have a minus sign built in there. I have k to the 2n because I have k squared to the n power. And then I have a binomial coefficient, which is minus half choose n. And those are all of the constants. The rest of everything else will be inside of the integral. And I've kind of quietly changed the order of integration and summation here, but we're allowed to do that in this case. So what's left over is the integral from 0 to pi halves of sine to the 2n theta d theta. So we've got something like that that's happening. OK, so now let's expand this using the definition of a binomial coefficient. So what's that? Well, we have a descending product starting at minus 1 half and then containing n total terms. So that'll be minus 1 half. The next one will be minus 3 halves. The next one will be minus 5 halves, all the way down to minus 1 half minus n plus 1. So that's n total terms there. And then this is over n factorial just to complete the definition of the binomial coefficient. Now let's notice that there are n total terms here and they all contain a minus sign. So in fact, what we can do is factor out a minus 1 to the n here, which will cancel with this minus 1 to the n that we have built into our binomial expansion from this minus sign. And then after factoring this minus sign and canceling it with this, notice that we can take this guy and rewrite it as 1 half 
times 3 halves times 5 halves all the way up to 1 half plus n minus 1. But that's exactly the definition of our rising factorial starting at 1 half. So this is 1 half sub n like this. Okay, so now let's take this 1 half sub n and let it take up the place of this binomial coefficient and this minus one to the end at the top of the next board, and then we'll continue on. So on the last board, we wrote our elliptical integral kk as the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of this rising factorial one half n over n factorial. Then we've got k to the two n, and then the integral from zero to pi over two of sine to the two n theta d theta. And now we're going to make use of the following fact, which is a power reducing formula for integrals of sine. And I won't prove this, but it's fairly straightforward to prove if you wanted to. So this is the integral from zero to pi over two of sine to the m theta d theta equals m minus one over m. The integral from zero to pi over two sine m minus, that should be two theta d theta. So now we can repeatedly apply this until we have sine to the zero theta or just d theta. So let's see, maybe I'll put this equals dot, dot, dot after repeated applications of this green box formula, which is in yellow chalk, we'll have the integral from, or sorry, the sum as n goes from zero to infinity, this rising factorial over n factorial, k to the 2n, and then we'll have 2n minus 1 times 2n minus 3 will be the next one, times 2n minus 5 will be the next one, all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1, but that's known as a double factorial because we're skipping one each time. So that'll be 2n minus 1 double factorial over 2n double factorial, because again, we'll have 2n times 2n minus 2 all the way down to the bottom. Then the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of just d theta, but that just gives us this pi over 2, like that. Okay, so now that we have something like this, I'm going to factor the pi out of pi over 2 out, because notice that shows, out, shows up out front anyway. And then we'll start working on the simplification. So here we have, this is the sum as n goes from 0 up to infinity of half n over n factorial. And then I'm going to maybe take this k to the 2n and move it to the right. And then we'll rewrite these things a little bit. So let's notice that we can take this and write it as one times three times five, all the way up to two n minus one. That's this double factorial over two times four times six, all the way up to two n. Then I've got this k to the two n right there. Okay, so this is starting to look good. Now let's take this denominator and do a little bit of simplification. So what I'd like to do is factor a two out of all of these even terms. And that's gonna give me one half times one half all the way up one half. And there are n total one halves. And then what's left over will be one times two all the way up to n, but that's like well known as n factorial. And now we can take these n one halves and combine them with these numbers up here. So let's maybe say that we're doing that. And that'll give us something like one over two times three over two from this three over two times five over two, all the way ending at two n minus one over two. But that notice that's exactly our rising factorial one half n. And then we've got this n factorial left over. So let's see what we have in the end. So this is going to be equal to pi halves, and then we'll have the sum as n goes from zero up to infinity. We have this rising factorial one half n as it was kind of given to us. We have this other rising factorial one half n that we just constructed out of this numerator and then all of these halves. We have an n factorial that's been coming along for the ride for a while. And then we have this other n factorial, which we just extracted out of this product of even numbers. But instead of writing n factorial here, I'm going to write this rising factorial 1n. Then we've got k to the 2n. 
But notice that's exactly what we need in order to write down this hypergeometric function. So that actually finishes this proof. And that's a good place to stop.